Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today we start off with Surah Baqarah, verses 74 onwards. And Rafi, in the end of the previous lecture, we spoke about an incident with Bani Israel where they had to slaughter a cow. And they had to put a piece of that cow on a person who had been, uh, who had been killed. And the person then was given life again and he pointed at his, <clears throat> at the individual who had killed him. But the interesting thing is that some scholars point out is that why did Allah say a cow in specific? That it's a cow that you have to slaughter. Oh, was it because they worshipped a cow when right. so, Musa al-Islam had gone uh, Right. So uh, what was Allah trying to tell them? That uh, this thing that you thought was, was supposed to be your God, now you're uh, killing it and putting its meat on top of a person so it can come back to life. Right, so from that you understand that the, this thing that they were worshipping, which is a cow, can it be a God? No. No, it cannot. Because um, uh, that God has been slaughtered, so clearly it cannot be something that is worth worshipping. It's right? yes. something that cannot even protect itself. How can you possibly think of it as a God? So that's another significance of saying cow in specific, okay? Then in verse 74, Allah says, um, Then your hearts became hardened after that. Now, uh, who is he still talking to? The Bani Israel. Right, so he says, Bani Israel, the, uh, in specific, their ancestors, their hearts became hardened after that. They became like stones or even harder. For indeed, there are stones from which rivers come out. There are stones um, of them, some that split open and water comes out. And there are some of them that fall down in the fear of Allah. Allah is not unaware of what you do. So he's talking about three kinds of stones here. He says there's one kind of stone from which rivers actually gush out. He says then there's one kind of stone that when it is split open and cracked open, there is water that comes out. And then there's another kind of stone that simply sinks in the fear of Allah. But he says the hearts of Bani Israel were very hard. They became like stones or even harder. So the heart of Bani Israel did not fall into any of these three, uh, these three different uh, groups. It, you know, so you have uh, the stone that has water coming out, the stone that has rivers gushing out, the stone that is sinking in the fear of Allah. But he says Bani Israel's heart was not even in any of these three different categories. It was even harder than this. Now, first of all, we have to understand what is this, what is Allah uh, actually talking about here. Um, according to the scholars and what they've done in this work of tafsir, they say the stone is analogous to a heart and water is analogous to iman. So the first kind of situation is a stone from which a river is gushing out. Okay, it comes out at very high speed. Uh, in science, I don't know if you remember, I told you about something uh, that is called a geyser. And I told you geyser is what happens is at times you have water on the surface of the earth and it sinks deep into the earth. It goes lower and lower and lower all the way down. It becomes very close to the core of the earth where you have something that's very hot. What is it called? Magma. Okay. So this water gets trapped really down deep down inside the earth. Below it is magma, which is very hot, and above it is layers and layers and layers of rock. And so what happens is from the top, there is there's this huge amount of pressure on it, and from the bottom, there is heated magma. And eventually what happens is the water just, when there's too much pressure and when it gets really hot, it just gushes out. And you can see, uh, um, if you go to places where they have, uh, where, where they have these kinds of geysers, you will see that from the surface, suddenly this hot steaming water just gushes out like full speed. Very similar to what Allah is talking about here. Okay. And this is analogous to, um, you know, someone who is at the stage of Ihsan. So when we are uh, trying to improve our faith, we're trying to become better and better Muslims. We have three different stages we go in. The lowest level is Islam. The stage after that is Iman. And the final stage is Ihsan. Ihsan is when you have achieved excellence in faith. So according to the Hadith, if you have reached the level of, uh, um, of excellence, of Ihsan, it is as if you worship Allah as if you can see Him. Or at least you have this strong belief that if I cannot see Him, He's definitely seeing me. Every single thing that I do, He's watching me. That is the level of Ihsan. 
And so this uh, specific rock that Allah is talking about, which is like a geyser, this is like a person who has reached the level of ihsan. And let me tell you how, uh, how that happens. First, the water sinks in, right? When it gets very deep down into the earth, it's trapped between two things. What are those two things? Uh, a magma uh, below it and layers and layers of rock above it which put pressure on The magma below it, it actually heats it. And from the top, you have pressure. So this is a kind of person who has, um, from below, it's, uh, it's like magma. In other words, his heart is burning whenever he sees the kind of cruelty and injustice that is happening in the world. So he's not someone who just, who, who is like oblivious, who doesn't care, who only is concerned about himself. He ponders and reflects so much that he looks at you know, the kind of things that are, that, that's happening in this world and he just asks himself, why, why are there people who are so poor? Why, why are there people who are so oppressed? Why is life at times so unfair towards certain people? He's pondering and reflecting so much that his heart is like burning with questions. Right. So he's very much um, at times we call these people who are that they are introverts. So they're always asking questions. They're involved in deep thought, deep analysis. You know, um, a, a lot of our scholars were also were specifically introverts because they were always sitting and pondering and pondering. Their heart burned with all these questions. And then on the top, you have layers and layers of rock that put pressure. Right. So for these people, on the bottom, their heart is burning with questions. And on the top, they have tests and calamities and hardship. Allah keeps piling more and more and more difficulties. Okay, so now we understand that the magma plays the effect of a heart that's burning with all kinds of questions, right? And a heart that's very troubled because of what it's seeing happening in the world. At the same time, the layers and layers of rock are very analogous to layers and layers of tests and hardships, right? But what is the role of Iman? You know, we talked about water entering, seeping down, that water is analogous to Iman. So how do we explain what's going on in terms of Iman entering the heart of this kind of a person? The best way that I can explain this, because when it comes to Iman, you cannot really define it, you cannot really measure it or quantify it. So the easiest way to explain Iman is when you have a heart that is very soft, so it's not a heart that is filled with uh, greed, arrogance, pride, um, you know, things that are very bad or evil or negative. You have a heart that is very soft, so it's cleansed of all of those evil things. It's a heart that is not in love with dunya. It is a heart that loves to show compassion and mercy and justice, very kind, very generous. That is called a very soft heart. Uh, a soft heart is also a heart that is always seeking the truth. So because that heart is not in love with dunya, that heart is always seeking the truth and it's willing to absorb the truth the minute it hears it. When you have a heart that is very soft and it's seeking the truth, then it will start to absorb the truth the minute it hears it. So, um, you know, uh, whether this is uh, somebody who is reciting the words of the Quran, whether this is a preacher who is preaching, whether it is even somebody who is a non-Muslim, but they're giving a, a really important and valuable, good information, a heart that is sincerely searching for the truth will be able to absorb it instantly and start thinking about it. That is what it means for Iman to enter. And since the Iman gradually keeps seeping deeper and deeper into the heart of a person who's at the level of Ihsan, because I told you that since for the geyser effect, the water goes really deep down, when it's very close to the magma. So in this case, the Iman seep, seeps very deep down into it. So this guy has a heart that is so soft that he's such a generous person and a kind, compassionate person and so desperate to, um, to seek the truth that whenever he hears something that makes sense to him, he instantly accepts it. Then he starts pondering over it. Then he starts to gather more information because he has this desire to understand the, the truth. He's a truth seeker. So the more he does research, the more he dives in, the more that water seeps down, the more that Iman seeps deeper and deeper into the heart. So on the top, there's hardship and difficulty. On the bottom, their heart is burning with questions. And then they have the geyser effect. They have this burst, this gushing out of water, gushing out of Iman that comes out of their heart. Let me give you an example. You know, um, Hazrat Abu Bakr, 
So when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, became a prophet and he went and he told a few of the people, a few of his friends that, you know, this is the specific incident that happened to me. This angel Jibreel came, he gave me these words and I, ha and I have been selected as a prophet of God. People like Hazrat Abu Bakr, they did not take years to believe. They believed instantly because their heart was already burning with all these questions. There was so much ignorance in Arabia so much oppression, so much torture, especially towards women, so much abuse, and all these gods that people were, you know, that they were actually busy, you know, praying to, that they had so many people like Hazrat Abu Bakr had a lot of questions in their heart that where, what exactly is the message of God? How can this be the reason that we were created? There has to be a, a, a purpose for our existence. What is that purpose? You get it? A lot of questions were being asked and then tests and calamities and hardship kept piling on. So the minute they heard just one verse coming from the Prophet's mouth, that was enough for them to uh, embrace Islam. That is immense Iman gushing out. And then you see people like Hazrat Abu Bakr using up all their gold just to free slaves and to try and bring people towards Islam. Okay. The second is an example of someone who is at the stage of, which one was it? Iman. 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 What was the lowest stage? Islam. Islam, Iman, Ehsan. So the second rock that is being explained is a person who is at the stage of Iman. So Allah says over here, I want, I want you to tell me what you think of this. It's a rock that has water inside. And when the rock splits or cracks open, then the water comes out. So this is an example in terms of science. When you have certain rocks, um, they, these rocks are, are called porous rocks. So the water seeps in and then it gets trapped inside. And when the temperature becomes very, very um, low, so it's freezing, the water becomes ice. And when the water becomes ice and it's trapped inside, the ice puts so much pressure on the rock, the rock cracks and splits open. And then after a while, the ice melts and the water comes out. Now, you know that the rock is analogous to heart and water is analogous to Iman. So you tell me what's happening with the person who's at this stage. Uh, 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 the thing that has happened to the person at this stage is that he's been given a lot of tests and difficulties. Okay. And he has been trying his best to pass all the tests and, you know, uh, in every sort of a difficulty, he... Uh, he always asks, uh, he always keeps a strong amount of faith in Allah. Yeah, but okay, let's focus back on this. Uh, the, and then, and then what happens? What happened to the rock? It, it cracked. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the water came out. I mean, Iman, you know, a lot of Iman. He came out of Okay, you're very close. You're very close. Let, let me tell you. This is the kind of person who does not ponder and reflect as much as the person who, who is at the stage of uh, at the stage of Ehsan. So he does he does ponder some, but he doesn't ponder that much. OK, and so he, this is uh, someone who who thinks about uh, Islam. He thinks about, you know, the prayers and zakat and fasting and, and all of those things. He understands that jihad is very important, but he's too scared to do it. He's too scared to make changes in his life. He's too scared to struggle in the cause of Allah. Like the person who is at the stage of, uh, of Ihsan, right? He just wants to do anything and everything for Allah. Okay. The person who is at the stage of Iman, he has belief. He's doing his basic prayers. But, you know, uh, to make drastic changes uh, in his lifestyle, that's a bit hard for him. He's a bit scared of society. And then eventually something happens in his life. That is an eye opener. It's like a massive test, something that causes his heart to crack, okay? And once that heart cracks, then the Iman starts to come out, all right? I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Hazrat Umar, right? What was the specific incident that happened to Hazrat Umar when he was going to visit his sister's house? Remember? He saw a shepherd uh, who was being oppressed when he, when he helped him. So the shepherd yeah, told no, no, him. Right, but, but that, was, that was way before. Um, when he was going to visit his sister's house, because someone had informed him that your sister has embraced Islam. So this was before Hazrat Umar had embraced Islam. This was in Mecca. The period of, of ignorance was still going on. And someone had told him that your sister has embraced Islam. 
and he was actually contemplating going to kill the prophet right he had not embraced islam yet and he was very upset that you know makkah has become this place of of, of violence and you know there's so much turmoil and there, there used to be a, a lot of peace and it's all happening because of this man called muhammad peace be upon him so he was contemplating to go and kill him and someone stopped him and said well why don't you first go talk to your sister because even she's become a a believer so he went to vi- visit his sister's house and over there he could hear that they were they were um saying certain verses of the quran so he went and he was so uh, angry he started beating up his own sister's husband and then his sister came in to try and stop him and by mistake by accident he kind of he he hit his sister as well and his sister started to bleed and suddenly it just occurred to him in my anger you know how am i behaving i just hit my sister and i'm beating up my own brother in law and then when he had calmed down he told his sister okay tell me show me the verses that you that i heard were being recited here in this house and she showed him the verses of surah taha and the very beginning verses the opening verses as he was reading them that is when the heart cracked so that is when he really really uh, absorbed the words and you know he really absorbed the message for the first time and his heart just cracked and then the iman started to come out and he immediately embraced islam and then he did whatever and everything he could for the purpose of islam okay so that is someone who's at the stage of iman which happens to people like us as well sometimes and the lower stage is a rock that falls in the fear, fear of allah so what is missing in in this rock uh it is not been cracked open with iman does allah mention any water entering this rock no so this is a heart that does not have iman so this is somebody who is at the lower stage of islam they are doing their five time prayers they're giving zakat fasting hajj they're doing everything they fear allah which is why it says the rock sinks in the fear of allah but there's no iman has not yet entered their hearts so this is somebody who is doing all the basic things required in islam but he's terrified of jihad he's terrified of any kind of struggle the minute islam becomes hard for him he backs down and says i cannot do this you get it so iman has not yet entered his heart that certainty that i will be standing in front of allah so i better start doing jihad that certainty that jihad is the only way to get to allah that is still it, it still lacks in his heart so these are the stages of islam iman and ihsan which stage you and me are at you will never know but the idea is that try and strive to improve yourself and get to the stage of ihsan and one final comment that i want to make here is that um these three stages can also be telling you that um some someone as a muslim starts off at the stage of islam then over time when they start to reflect a bit more on the verses of the quran they start to have a desire to do jihad iman enters their heart so you know so now they're they're thinking about it they start to do a, like a, a small amount of jihad as much as they can and then eventually something happens in their life their heart cracks open and the iman starts to come out so now they are at the stage of iman and then they start to reflect and ponder even more they start to dedicate more time at, uh, in jihad and in struggle they start to have less fear of society less fear of what people will think and then they are able to move at the stage of ihsan so this is the beauty of these three stages okay it it also explains the stages that a believer goes through to go from islam to iman to ihsan and the interesting thing is allah says well for bani israel their hearts don't even follow they don't fall into any of these three categories so even the lowest category they don't even fall into that they don't even have fear of allah in their hearts anymore okay they are not conscious of god at all and <clears throat> before i move on one final thing that when i was studying the seer what i found interesting about this is that the lowest level is islam right that is when you're doing five time prayers zakat fasting hajj and you have practicing tawhid and what i didn't know is that if there is a muslim who's not even doing five time prayers 
they're not even doing prayers at all, or maybe they aren't even fasting. Do they even fall into the category of Islam? No. No. So they are calling themselves what? Muslim. But are they Muslim? No. They are saying we are the Ummat of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Have they even entered the, the Ummat? No. No. And a lot of our people don't know this. A lot of our kids even don't know this. They think, I call myself Muslim, I believe in Allah, I am at the stage of Islam. Well, actually, you're not. For the stage of Islam, you've got to follow the five pillars. That's the basic, basic level. <clears throat> and so then we come to verse 75. Allah says, do you have the hope, O believers, that they would believe in you? while a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then distorted it after they had understood it while they were knowing. And when they meet those who believe, they say, we have believed, but when they are alone with one another, they say, do you talk to them about what Allah has revealed to you so that they can argue with you about it before your Lord? Will you not reason? But they do not know that Allah knows what they conceal and what they declare. Now, this is really interesting. Um, what would happen was... <coughs> Um, I, when the Jews had come to Medina, first of all, why did the Jews even settle in Medina? Remember M Medina, Makkah, the entire Arab region. We, they, uh, uh, people who were called Bani Ismail, they were living in the Arab region, right? The Jews were Bani Israel, right? They didn't like, uh, the, they had no uh, liking for the Arabs. They didn't, they thought of uh, Bani Ismail as being people who were very illiterate. They have never received a prophet. So when they don't even like Bani Ismail, when they don't even like the Arabs, why had many Jews settled in Medina in the first place? Any idea? No. The Jews have a book, um, uh, the Torah, okay? And in the books that were given to them from their prophets, it had been prophesied that a final prophet is going to come and he's going to come to a land that is surrounded by palm trees. And so they knew that uh, in the, you know, palm trees, well, of course, they grow at that time, this I'm talking about 14, 1500 years ago, palm trees were mostly in the area of the Arab region, okay? And in specific, because the entire Arab region was a desert, the only place where there was a proliferation of palm trees was... Medina. Medina. So the Jews came and they started to settle down in, in Medina because they said, you know what, our prophet has been prophesied and he's coming to Medina. Now, when the Jews first came to uh, Medina, the, they didn't like the Arabs and the Arabs did not like them. So at times what would happen is they would get into, uh, you know, uh, small fights. And every time they would get into fights, normally the Arabs would win because the Arabs were known for being warriors. Okay, they, they, I mean, these were people who always had lived in tribes, they had lived in the desert, they were accustomed to fighting, the Jews were not. So mostly the Arabs would win and the Jews would lose. And every time the Jews would lose, they would tell the Arabs, you just wait, our prophet is coming. It has been prophesied in our books. And when he comes, we will become so powerful that we will then take over everything, okay? So yes, you have beaten us up right now, but wait, our prophet is coming. So the Arabs in Medina, as well as in Makkah, as, in, as well as in the Arab region, they had heard this from the Jews so many times, a prophet is coming, a prophet is coming, a prophet is coming, right? That, and I told you, the Arabs always looked up to the Jews. They, they acknowledged that these guys have always received prophets, they have always received books. So they were like, okay, well, according to them, our prophet is coming, let's see. So when Muhammad, peace be upon him, came, and then he migrated and he went to Medina, the place which had been prophesied in their books. And the, all the Arabs in Medina embraced Islam. The Arabs were very confused about what, about what exactly? So why are the Jews accepting yeah. Islam? So the Jews in Medina said, oh, no, 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 he's, he's, he's not a prophet and we deny him. And they were so amazed because they said, you were the ones who kept telling us a prophet is coming. Now this man has come. He's giving the same message as, as the, the message that you guys are following. The words that he's using, it's the same as what you have in your books. And he even believes in all of your prophets. He believes in Musa and Isa and all of those prophets. 
Why aren't you? Uh, why aren't you uh, believing in him? Uh, they wouldn't believe in them because Abu Akhir Salam was was actually sent out to Bani Ismail. Right. In Mecca, that's why they. So, so they were very confused, and so Allah is telling them in verse seventy-five, "Why do you think that? You know, why is it confusing you? Do you think that these guys, these Jews, would actually believe when a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then they would distort it? In other words, these guys have distorted their own books. These guys have gone against their own prophets. Okay, so." Why do you, um, you know, why does it confuse you or surprise you that the Jews are not believing in Muhammad, peace be upon him? That's what their ancestors did. And that's what these guys do as well. That jealousy and hatred is inside of them. Then why did the final prophet go to the Arabs? It was supposed to come to us. Right? So this is what Allah is telling them. And then Allah is telling the, uh, the Muslims that these Jews... When they meet amongst each other, this is exactly what they say. It's, a, it's quoted in verses 76 and 77. When they meet the Muslims, they say, oh yeah, uh, absolutely, you're 100% right. We do believe your message is, is very accurate. They say we have believed. But when they are alone with each other, they tell each other, are you telling them, are you telling the Muslims about what Allah has revealed to you so that they can argue about it before your Lord? In other words, what that means is um, when the Muslims would talk to some of their Jewish friends and tell them that, listen, we just heard uh, this story of, uh, for example, uh, Adam and Iblis, right? Uh, and it's a very interesting story. Do you have the same story in your books? All right? And, the Jew and their Jewish friends would say, yeah, it's exactly the same. And then when they would go back to, to their scholars and to their rabbis, their rabbis would scold them and say, if you, if you tell your uh, Arab friends, if you tell the Muslims that whatever your prophet is saying is exactly what is in our books, right? Then Allah is going to hold you accountable on the day of judgment. Allah is going to say, well, when you know he's giving the same message, why don't you believe in him? Get it? So they were telling their own Jews, don't tell the, uh, the Arabs, don't tell the Muslims what is in your book because you are offering a testimony against yourself because then the Muslims will say well if it's the exact same message what's your problem and even Allah will question you on the day of judgment so just deny right just say no 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 uh, we actually have never heard that story before that story is not in our books you get it now the Arabs the Muslims who are in Arabia they did not know how to read Hebrew very 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 few of them could majority could not and the, and the Torah was all in Hebrew. So the, the Muslims had to ask the Jews, do you have this in your book? They could not read it themselves, right? So if the Jews say, no, this story is not in our books, and they would say, okay, fine. Well, my Jewish friend said that it's not in his book. You get it? So this is how uh, Allah is quoting that, that you know, they're um, conspiring against you guys. And what is the most uh, silly thing about what they're thinking? They believe that, listen, don't tell the Muslims because then even Allah will question you. Will Allah not already question them? Does Allah not know what's going on in their hearts? Does Allah not know what book he sent? Right? Yeah. So their argument has no basis. And so this is the reason why Allah says in verse 77, do they not know that Allah knows exactly what they are hiding and what they are declaring? I mean, how could you possibly trick God, right? So then in verses 78 and 79, Allah says, And among them are the unlettered ones who do not know the scripture except in wishful thinking, but they are only assuming. So woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands, and then they say, this is from Allah, in order to exchange it for a small price. Woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what they earn. So now in verse 78, Allah is talking about um, some of the, uh, the illiterate amongst the people of the book. People of the book are the Jews and the Christians, right? So what this is believed to be is that, um, first of all, when you look at the Jews in Medina, there were three tribes of Jews. You should know this. What were their names? The three tribes of Jews. Um... Banu. Wow. 
Oh, Banu Kainuka. Yes. Uh, those tribes. Yeah, those tribes. Uh, Banu Kureza, Banu Kainuka, and Banu Nazir. Banu Nadir. Okay. So the, these were three Jewish tribes that had settled in Medina, right? And it's believed in this verse, what Allah is talking about, is that some of the Jews might have been Jews who did not know Hebrew language. So they had never studied the, the actual book. They had never studied the Torah. And because they had never studied it, they had no idea what was written inside of it. They just came up with their own conjectures, their own stories. And they would go, go around telling, um, telling the Arabs that, oh, this is what is mentioned in our books when it was never mentioned. But they don't know themselves because they don't know Hebrew and they don't know how to read their books. Okay. And it's also believed that maybe there were also some Arabs who had converted to Judaism. Okay, so they believed that they were part of the Jews. And because they, they didn't know Hebrew language, they had no idea what was in the Torah. So they would go around making all these claims that, uh, you know, a goddess has said this to us in our book. God has given this message. God has said this when God actually has never said any of those things. Okay, and so Allah is quoting that as well, that they are illiterate. They don't even know what's in the Torah, but they just have their own wishful thinking. And many of them, especially the rabbis, the scholars, they actually changed. They made distortions. And then they said, no, this is actually from Allah. This is not something I'm, I'm making up. This is from God. And they would exchange it for a small price. In other words, what that means is the rabbis and the scholars, they wanted to maintain their power. Okay, and in order to maintain their power and in order to give power to the Jews, they would make alterations. And I'll give you one example. Sood. You know what Sood is, right? Yeah. Sood is halal or haram. Right. Yeah. It's haram. Um, what the, and it's always been haram, right? So even for the Jews, it was haram. In every, since the beginning of time, it's been haram. But in the Torah, what, what the rabbis did was they made an alteration. And so now when you see the Old Testament, it says that Sood is haram if you are charging Sood from a Jew. But if you are charging Sood from a non-Jew, then it's perfectly fine. So in other words, if there is a Jew who has borrowed money from you, then do not charge him Sood because that would be a huge sin. But if there is a non-Jew who has borrowed money from you, then you can charge him Sood. It's perfectly halal. Now so could is interest, right? right interest. Now could God ever have given a message like that? No. These are the distortions that they make, and then they say, "No, this is it's in our books. This is from Allah." When Allah is saying it's not from me, these are distortions you have made, and you will be questioned about it. You have written this with your own hands, and you're putting Allah's name on it. All right. In the same way, they've made huge wrong claims about prophets, like. Uh, in their books, they have mentioned that Suleiman had a lot of wives and, uh, and one of his wives was um, someone who was a kafir. And so he loved, he loved that wife so much that he himself started to worship idols. Right? That doesn't make any sense because he's a prophet. We know that that's impossible, but they have written stories like this in their own books. And, it, and then they say, well, it's from Allah. When we know it's not from Allah. Got it? Okay. Then verses 80 onwards, it says, And they say, never will Jahannam, never will the fire touch us, except for a few days. So Allah says, say to them, have you taken a promise from Allah? For Allah, because Allah never breaks his promise. Or are you saying something about Allah, which you don't even know? And Allah says, yes, whoever earns evil, and his sin has completely encompassed him, they will be companions of Jahannam, they will abide therein forever. But those who believe and do good deeds, they will be companions of Jannah, they will abide therein forever. So Allah is telling them, well, first of all, I, I, I have never made a promise like this. If I have, then why don't you open up the Torah and show me where have I said that all Jews were going to Jannah. And if they go into Jahannam, it'll just be for a, few, uh, for a couple of days. Eventually, I'll put them back into Jannah. Where have I said that? And secondly, Allah is repeating that, let me tell you who goes to Jannah. The person who believes in God, and believing in God means you believe in all of his prophets and all of his books, and you do good deeds. And since the final prophet has come, you better believe in him, otherwise there's no chance of Jannah. 
and who goes into jahannam not the non jews who goes to jahannam those who disbelieve those who are um surrounded by all kinds of evil and sins that they are involved in okay and then allah says over here in verse 83 to 86 and recall when we took the covenant from the children of israel and joining upon them do not worship anyone except allah and to parents be very good and to relatives orphans and the poor speak to people with good words establish prayer give zakat so jews were also told to establish prayer and give zakat and then it says then you turned away except a few of you and you were refusing and recall when we took your covenant saying do not shed each other's blood or banish one another from your homes then you acknowledge this while you were witnessing then you are the same ones who are killing one another and you're banishing party of your people from their homes cooperating against them in sin and aggression and if they come to you as captives you ransom them although their banishment was forbidden to you so do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part of it then what is the what is the recompense for those who do that amongst you except disgrace in this world and on the day of resurrection they will be sent back to the severest punishment allah is not unaware of what you do those are the ones who have brought the life of this world in exchange for the hereafter so the punishment will not be lightened for them nor will they be aided so this uh, verse 83 is allah reminding the jews about the 10 commandments you know giving them an idea be nice to your parents be nice to the poor be nice to uh, those who are your relatives needy orphans wayfarer and so on and at the same time don't worship anyone except allah right and very similar commands are given in the quran right so it is impossible that a jew at that time heard the verses of the quran and could not recognize that this is exactly the same commands that we have been given this must be coming from the same god right and then a very interesting thing is uh, allah is explaining here this is hard to understand so let me explain to you 84 85 and 86 what's exactly going on when the jews came to medina right i told you that in the beginning what was going on between them and the arabs they were fighting why were they fighting because the jews are considered the arabs to you know not be very smart and they never you know a thought a thought of them being something big matlab they never gave them any respect okay because they said okay bani ismail has never received a prophet so these people are very illiterate we have always uh, received prophets so what started to happen is that over time because they were living in medina for decades and they were waiting for their prophet to come they realized okay we have to make you know we have to build some uh, ties some friendly ties with the arabs otherwise it's impossible for us to live here so in specific banu kainuka became friends with um the khazraj tribe in medina remember there were two arab tribes in medina that were always fighting oh, us and, and khazraj so khazraj became friends with banu kainuka they became allies and banu nadir and banu qureza became friends with the aus tribe get it now here's the problem when aus and khazraj start to fight with each other and they were always fighting who has to join in uh the tribes which tribes uh, they have a party along with the separate the jews the jews yeah right so if aus and khazraj are fighting then aus's friends have to jump in and khazraj's friends have to jump in so now when you have a battle is it just arabs fighting arabs no what else has started to happen it's jews fighting jews jews are fighting jews and their books have told them that these guys jews you are brothers for each other you are an ummah you don't fight amongst each other you don't spread bloodshed and violence you cannot kill each other and what are and what are these jews doing fighting amongst they they and they know it's in the torah they know it's wrong but they said listen we have to build political ties with our arab friends otherwise it's impossible for us to live here so since i've become friends with khazraj or maybe i become friends with us i have to jump in i have to help them 
So now Jews are fighting with Jews. They're not only killing them, but they are also banishing them. So in other words, let's say Aus and Khazraj are fighting in one area, which means their Jewish friends are also fighting. And let's say Khazraj, the tribe of Khazraj wins. So then the tribe of Aus and, and all the Jews over there will be banished. Okay? Now later on, what started to happen is once you start to fight and you win, then the defeating party becomes your slave. They, they come to you as captives, right? Now, since we've already established that the Arabs were fighting Arabs, but Jews were also fighting Jews, in your defeating party, in the party that, that faced defeat, you have Arabs and, mm -hmm. and Jews, okay? Because you have Arabs and Jews, when they would come to the victorious party as captives or as slaves, then the Jews who were part of the, of, the, uh, of the winning party, the Jews that were part of the victorious party, they would look at their Jewish brothers who have come to them as captives and they would feel sorry for them. And then they would ransom them, which means they would use their own money and they would offer it as ransom to free their Jewish brothers who were slaves, right? Because that is what Torah has told them to do. But Allah is saying, yes, you're doing what the, well, you're following the commands of Allah, but why were you fighting with them in the first place, right? So you are doing something where you're following one part of God's book and you're ignoring the other part. So you're paying for their ransom because you feel bad for them, but then you were, you were the ones who were fighting with them in the first place, which you should not have been doing. This is what the verses 84, 85, and 86 are telling them. And this is all addressing the Jews because it's reminding the Jews that every single thing you were doing, God has been watching you and he's calling you out in the Quran. Now, is this a message? That is only for the Jews, or do you see us as Muslims doing something very similar? Uh, well, I think some or most Muslims uh, in modern times, maybe they do do some uh, stuff that are really similar to this. Do you see Muslims as following one part of the Quran and ignoring the other part? Let me make the question easier. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> um, well, tell me, do you see Muslims who are following certain commands that are there in the Quran and other commands that are there, they know it, but they completely ignore it. Some. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So, we, although we are the new ummah, that status has been given to us. Allah is, is mentioning this in the Quran, not just because he's calling out the Jews and he's warning the Jews, but who else is he warning? Us. Us. That just because you're the ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, does not mean that you will get a ticket into Jannah. You have a Quran, it has commands, follow all of them. You cannot pick and choose that I'll follow this and I will ignore this. you got to do everything. Okay? Then in verse 87, Allah says, And we did certainly give Musa the Torah and followed up after him with many messengers. And we gave Isa, السلام, the son of Maryam, clear proofs and supported him with the pure spirit, the pure spirit being Jibreel. But is it not that every time a messenger came to you, O oh, Bani Israel, with what your souls did not like, you became arrogant, and a party of messengers you denied, and another party you even killed. So again, he's reminding Bani Israel. Uh, is it possible for uh, the ummah of the Prophet to kill the Prophet themselves? Um, what you will see is when you study the history of Bani Israel, they did not, of course, kill Musa, salam, but there were many messengers who they did kill. Now, here's a difference between a Rasul and a Nabi. Okay? A Nabi is someone who, is, uh, who basically comes to his nation and tells the nation that, listen, you guys are, uh, you, you all have gone off track. A Rasul came to you before. He told you what the message was. He told you he had a Sunnah and he gave you a Sharia. You guys have to start following that, that person who came to you. You have to follow that Rasul. That's the job of the Nabi. A Rasul, when, when a Rasul is sent, then he comes and he has his own sunnah. He has his ways of, of worshipping Allah, which everyone has to follow. And at the same time, he brings laws and he brings a sharia with him. So and he tells them... So, after Salam is a Rasul. 
Muhammad peace uh, upon him is a Rasul. Musa alayhi salam is a Rasul. Isa alayhi salam is also a Rasul. So, but why is it that you know many times he is called as a, a, a Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi salam? Because a Rasul is also a Nabi, but a Nabi cannot be a Rasul. And I'll tell you why. Because when a, when a Rasul comes, is he also giving the message? Yeah. And that's exactly what a Nabi does, right? But a Rasul is a Nabi with one status higher in the sense that he has been appointed to a particular nation and Allah says, go there, teach them the deen because they are a group of disbelievers. So teach them the deen, tell them exactly what the Sharia is, tell them the laws of Allah, teach them from scratch. And they have to follow everything that you do because you are a Rasul. So the way you worship God, the way uh, the way you um, you know live your life, the entire Sunnah, everything has to be followed. But when a, when a Nabi comes, then a Nabi is just a Nabi. He's not a Rasul as well, which means he will come and say, "Listen, did a did a, a Rasul come to you before?" And the people will say yes, and then the Nabi will say, "Well, follow." exactly what that Rasul told you. You you guys have forgotten, right? So a Nabi is always sent to a nation that is already believers, but they have gone a bit off track. And a Rasul is sent to a nation of disbelievers who have completely forgotten. They have completely, uh, they have no idea of what God is or who God is. And so they have to start from zero. They have to start from scratch. Then why is it that Hazrat Musa Islam was sent to Bani Israel as a prophet? Because Bani Israel uh, were the basically kind of the believers. descendants of the Hazrat Bani Israel, Israel were believers; they were Muslims. So why was a Rasul Musa Islam sent to believers when I just told you that a Rasul is sent to disbelievers? Right? Very good question. Musa Islam was not sent to Bani Israel. Musa Islam was sent to Firon. When Musa Salam became a prophet, Allah said, go to Firan and give him my message and tell him that he better embrace Islam and he better free Bani Israel. Allah did not say, go to Bani Israel and give them my message and teach them who Allah is. So Musa was not sent to Bani Israel. He was sent to Firan, that was a nation of, uh, of idol worshippers and a nation of disbelievers. You get it? But that was a very good question. So, uh, as I was saying in verse 87, what Allah is telling, uh, the, He's telling Bani Israel and He's telling the Arabs as well, that when it comes to the children of Israel, their ancestors behaved in a certain way and the Jews right now are also behaving in the same way that every time someone comes to them, who their heart tells them this is a prophet, because he's saying things that they don't like, they end up going against him. They end up even at times trying to kill him. Now, did, did they kill Musa alayhi salam? No, they did not. But if you look at the history, it's believed that they killed uh, Prophet Isaiah. They tried to kill Prophet uh, Elijah. And uh, they strongly disobeyed Musa alayhi salam. And they even strongly disobeyed a prophet called Prophet Mika. You know, so they had thousands of prophets that were sent uh, to no, them. No, uh, how did they kill a prophet? Right. The reason they killed a prophet is because I told you the difference between a Rasul and a Nabi, right? Nabis have been killed and can be killed. A Rasul can never be killed. So when you look in the in the Quran, when you study about the different qoms, the different nations that came and the, the Rasuls that were sent to them, their people went against the, the Rasul. They tried to harm the Rasul, but they were never able to harm him. They were never able to kill him. Allah did not allow it. Because the Rasul has to, has to convey the message. He has to convey the Sharia. He has to convey the Sunnah. If, he, if he's killed, then he's not done his mission, right? So Allah protects the, the, the Rasul. All that does happen is at the end, Allah's azab comes. All the disbelievers are killed, but the Rasul and his followers are always saved. A Nabi is not bringing his own Sunnah. He's not bringing his own Sharia. He's just reminding people that someone came to you before, you guys have to follow him. So Nabis can be killed and they have been killed. Prophet Mika, who was uh, strongly, uh, he was strongly criticized. Prophet Elijah, they attempted to kill him. Prophet Isaiah, they did in fact kill him. These were all Nabis. 
Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam. He was killed by the Jews. Who was he? Nabi or Rasul? Nabi. He was a Nabi. Okay? So Nabis have been killed and they can be killed, but a Rasul can never be killed. And so Allah is reminding the Arabs and He's reminding Bani Israel that this is a characteristic feature of you guys. That if a Prophet comes and he says something that you don't like, like he tells you, you guys are doing wrong. You guys have distorted your books. Uh, you, guys, uh, you guys are following a deen that is not the deen God sent. Every time he says something which you guys don't like, you end up trying to kill him or you end up strongly going against him. So this is a feature of you guys. And so the Jews in Medina were being warned, your ancestors did this, you guys better not behave in the same way. And then the scholars in specific in verse 88, Allah says the scholars would say, our hearts are wrapped, but Allah has cursed them for their disbelief. So li little is it that they believe. In other words, they would say, we have all the knowledge in the world. Allah has told us everything. We don't need to hear any more of what you have to say. Our hearts are wrapped. We have preserved all the knowledge that we need. And whatever you have to tell us, Muhammad peace be upon him, it's not important. So we are just totally not interested. Okay, and then in verse 89 and 90, now this is interesting, you will now tell me what this means. Oh. Yeah, so listen carefully. And when there came to them a book from Allah, confirming that which was already with them, although before they used to pray for victory against those who disbelieved, but then when came to them that which they should have recognized, they disbelieved in it. So the curse of Allah will be upon the disbelievers. How wretched is that for which they sold themselves that they should disbelieve in what Allah has revealed through their outrage that Allah would send his favor upon whom he wills from among his servants. So they returned having earned wrath upon wrath and for the disbelievers it's a humiliating punishment. Well, the first half I can do, the second half I do. <laughs> okay, tell me the first half. The first half, uh, what I basically think Allah Ta'ala is basically saying is that uh, what you told that uh, uh, that the Jews would always have a, a get into conflict with the, with the Arabs. Yes. Uh, and they would say that... Um, uh, that uh, that a prophet is gonna come uh, yes. over here and, and then he's gonna help us and Brilliant. he's gonna be powerful and then he's basically saying that before you got the uh, Torah of which it's uh, told you a lot of these rules and now a new book has come which is confirming which is, that uh, which is uh, confirming that and before uh, and, you guys used to pray for victory against the Arabs you you would pray Allah send us that that prophet so we can be victorious and now when I've sent it. What are you guys doing? Denying it. You're denying it. Brilliant. And Very you good. Read the second half. I forgot. Now, the second half is basically saying the same thing. That how wretched is that for which you have sold yourselves, that they would disbelieve in what Allah has revealed because of their anger that Allah would send his favor upon whom he wills from among his servants. So basically they didn't believe because they were angry that... At uh, they, were, they, were, they were angry that uh, the Allah Ta'ala sent Muhammad to Mecca instead of Medina, uh, to Bani Ismail instead of Bani That Ismail. Allah sent a prophet who was an Arab. Yeah. So he, Allah selected Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was Bani Ismail. So Allah saying the only reason you're not believing in him is because of this anger and outrage that God chose an Arab over us, which basically means that our status as a chosen nation has been taken away. We cannot go around showing off anymore that we are Bani Israel, we are the chosen nation, because guess who Allah just chose now? Bani Ismail. Our status has been taken away from us. That's the only reason. Okay, and then verse 91, Allah says, And when it is said to them, Believe in what Allah has revealed, they say, We believe only in what was revealed to us. And they disbelieve in what came after it, while it is the truth confirming that which is already with them. Then say to them, if that is the case, then why did you kill the prophets of Allah before, if you are indeed believers? Here's uh -huh. an amazing argument. Tell me, what does it mean? Uh, it, it basically means that they were saying, oh, we're not going to believe in uh, uh, the prophet of Muhammad 
uh, and the Quran because and we will only believe in the book that we got, which is the Torah. Right. And then Allah Taala saying, although uh, this new book is basically a confirming what you already had. Right. And the Jews are basically saying that uh, we are we have a uh, uh, we you know we have a really strong iman and we're only gonna believe in the book we got. So these uh, so the argument is that uh, they're saying. That uh, uh, if you really had a strong iman, then why did you kill uh, the prophets uh, that were sent by Allah before? Right. So Allah is saying, very good. Allah is saying that the Jews responded by telling them that, listen, we only believe in the prophets that were sent to us. Yeah. So Allah is saying, uh, well, then hold on. Then why did you kill the prophets that were sent to you? Why did you go against the prophets that were sent to you? Now, tell me something. This is where I want you to stop and think, how amazing is this argument? If the Jews had made this argument to Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the, he, they had made this argument to the Muslims, okay? Mm -hmm. And Allah did not reveal any verse. Could the Muslims have answered back to them? No. Why not? Because they don't know the history. Of because them. they have no idea. They don't know that these guys, their ancestors, tried to kill prophets, right? That's why Allah jumps in and he gives them the argument. He says, tell them that if this is what your argument is, then by the way, why did you guys try to kill your prophets? Now, do the Jews have an answer? No. No. Can you imagine how awesome this is? That the Jews are now conspiring against the Muslims because they have all this information. They are the people of the book. Right? No, but they the do Jew, have. Uh, can't the Jews just say that uh, uh, we never kill our prophets previously? Because they know it's in their books. But what they don't understand is how does he know? How does this Arab who doesn't even know Hebrew, how does he know that we have actually gone against? And then, by the way, Surah Baqarah, Allah has given specific events that took place where they went against Musa, salam, where they worshipped a cow where a plague was sent upon them because they were told to say a certain word and they changed the word. I mean, Allah has provided them with so much proof now. You get it? Mm -hmm. This is how it's so amazing. Allah jumps in and says, says, okay, you guys don't have the answer. Let me provide the answer for you. And then in verse 92, it says, and Musa had certainly brought you. Now Allah is continuing on with his argument. Musa brought you a lot of proofs. Then you took the cow in worship after that, while you were wrongdoers. And recall when we took your covenant, we raised above you a mountain saying, take what we have given you with determination and listen. And they instead, instead of saying we listen, we hear and we obey, they said we hear and we disobey. Imagine their audacity. And Allah says, their hearts absorbed the worship of the cow because of their disbelief. Say, how wretched is that which your faith enjoys upon you if you should be believers. So despite all of that, Allah is saying for many of them in their hearts, they secretly still loved that cow. And what happened to that cow will be explained later on uh, in the Quran. And uh, the last two verses here, verse 94, 95. Allah says, say, O Muhammad, peace be upon him. If the home of the hereafter, this is a beautiful argument now that Allah again is jumping in and he's providing to help the Muslims. And you will tell me what this argument is. <laughs> he's saying, Prophet, tell them, if the home of the hereafter is for you alone and not for anyone else, then I want you to wish and pray for death if you are truthful. Oh, so he's basically saying that if you guys believe, because you who's who's you guys Jews, if yeah. you Jews uh, believe and you tell uh, and you tell uh, and you tell everyone that Allah Taala has chosen us that uh, in the end we will uh, we will always go to Jannah. So Allah Taala is basically saying that if you truly believe this and prove this by, by praying uh, by praying for death, so you can go to heaven already. But, and, and Allah says, but they will never wish for it because of what their hands have put forth. Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. So a challenge was given to them and they would never do it. They never raised their hands and said, Ya Allah, please give us death. Because they knew in their hearts that nowhere in the Torah is it mentioned that you will definitely go to Jannah because you are a Jew. And they know what their hands have done. They know the evil that they have done. They know the books that they have distorted. 
they will never wish for it. <clears throat> and this is the sad thing. They know what they've done is wrong, but they also don't want to change themselves. Right? So great. Thank you so much, Rafi. We will end here and start off with verse 96 in the next class. Assalamu alaikum.